Welcome to the Lend Academy podcast, episode number 37. This is your host, Peter Renton, founder of Lend Academy. Today on the show, I am delighted to welcome Frank Rotman. He is a partner at QED Investors, and he also spent over a decade at Capital One, including some time running their uh, personal loans business. So for that reason, he has a unique perspective on this industry. Uh, QED Investors is a firm that has made probably more investments in this space, in the lending industry than anyone else. And uh, his role there has has basically exposed him to all of the the leading companies that we uh, that we have today and all all the new ideas that uh, that keep arising. So wanted to get him on the show, talk a bit about that, but also to talk about his white paper that I put it on Lend Academy a bit over a month ago. And uh, I think it's been, a, it's been a very well-received paper. He talked about it at Lend It, and we're going to go in depth into that white paper in the show. Hope you enjoy the show. Welcome to the podcast, Frank. Glad to be here. Okay, let's just get started with just giving the listeners a little bit of background about yourself, uh, particularly about your your time at Capital One. Sure, sure. So for the past uh, 20 plus years, I've been in the fintech space with my formative days being uh, back at Capital One. And uh, back in the Capital One days, I spent most of my time either building businesses from scratch that the company needed or fixing some of the large businesses when they were broken. So I was one of the earliest people with my hands on the subprime credit card business as an example, Uh, spent a lot of time in super prime and rewards, Uh, spent a lot of time on exotic asset classes, and, you know, then ultimately uh, moved on to help uh, outside of the credit card world with everything from diversification into other asset classes and different geographies, and even managing some of the exotic asset classes for the company. Spent a lot of time also in horizontal roles that included, you know, the chief credit officer role of the company uh, before it was even an official role, and uh, managing some of the the big operational areas strategically. So collections, recoveries, fraud, some of the big areas there. So you know, had a variety of different roles and left Capital One in 2005 to build a student lending company, and then helped found uh, QED Investors with two of my compatriots from Capital One in late 2007, early 2008. Okay, so then let's just talk a little bit about the QED. So I guess, like, what was the thinking behind the formation of that company? Why did you join it? And and what are you you focused on there? Sure. So QED was formed, you know, a little more than seven years ago with two other notable ex-Capital One executives. So Nigel Morris was the co-founder of Capital One and the uh, president and COO, and really the heart and soul of you know Capital One and scale up to 20,000 individuals across the globe. Uh, Caribou Honig was our other initial partner, founding partner, and you know he really helped analytically understand how to originate customers in a repeatable fashion at Capital One. So really a marketing genius and spent a lot of time cracking the code on different uh, marketing channels within Capital One. And the three of us really found ourselves in the market at the same time, uh, wondering what we should be doing and what we could do next. And we came together to form QED investors and realized that our operating skills were a little bit different than those of uh, other VCs and private equity firms because of our experience. And we are going to try to use our own capital. We've never raised outside money to help early stage and even mid stage companies grow. And, you know, we're a little bit different than most where we're really operators disguised as investors. And, you know, we roll up our sleeves, get in there hands on, and we felt like this would make a difference. So for the past seven and a half years, we've been investing our own capital and, and really trying to help as many companies as we could. Right. Right. So let's, uh, let's start digging into that a little bit. You, know, you you invested in Prosper back in the not the very early days, but um, still back in two thousand and nine, I think it was. So obviously you you did a bit of um, quite a bit of due diligence there, I imagine. So what what made you um, what firstly what got Prosper on your radar, and then why did you decide to invest? 
Well, another former Capital One executive, Raj Date, was involved with Prosper at the time. And, you know, he let us know about Prosper and really spent a little bit of time with us on it. Um, we were talking to some of the other notable platforms that were out in the industry at the time, but we spent more time with Prosper than with the others. And, you know, you're right, this was not in the earliest of early days, but it was post-SEC, uh, very, very soon after uh, Prosper had rebooted. It was only originating about a million dollars a month of volume. And to put that in perspective, before they shut down, they were originating between six and ten million a month. So it was still a very early industry. And, you know, what we liked about it was the concept. You know, it was the first time that consumers were going to have access to an asset class in depth and yield what was being projected to Prosper. And the problem was that Prosper just hadn't been able to deliver on its promise in, you know, the earliest of early days. And, you know, the reasons for not being able to deliver on the promise of returns were very obvious. So it's not like it was a mystery where, you know, the platform wasn't, you know, generating positive returns, in fact, significant positive returns for investors and wasn't, you know, delivering money-saving offers to consumers. That was really the goal. It just wasn't happening. And the reasons for it were obvious. So, again, the lender returns were negative on average. Uh, the risk models needed a complete overhaul. It, it was really obvious that you couldn't let the market determine the price when the market consisted of retail investors who didn't actually understand risk analytics and credit policy. You know, there were even details like the verification process was very underwhelming. And, you know, the company had a single product with a three-year loan. So, you know, there were a lot of very tactical things that we felt comfortable being able to roll up our sleeves and help the company with. And if you solved those issues and, you know, created a very strong set of competencies within the company on behalf of investors and borrowers, the expandability of, of the platform at the time seemed limitless. You know, if, if you go back and read my original investment memo, which I did recently, it's interesting how we speculated that, you know, this could be applied to student, this could be applied to auto, this could be applied to other asset classes. And at the time, we thought that, you know, Prosper was the platform to crack personal loans and then move on to other asset classes on the platform. But it was just very compelling in concept. Right. And then, um, so your, your partner, Nigel Morris, you know, joined the, the board of Prosper and obviously, you know, was intimately involved in the company over the next several years. So when I don't want to get, I don't want to make this all about Prosper this uh, this podcast, but I just want to have one more follow up. I and mean, you've you obviously saw the company go through a dramatic change uh, with a, you know, a recapitalization. You know when the Vermouths and, and Ron Suba came back came in. What were your thoughts back then, and how do you feel the the company is? You know what what really changed at Prosper? Sure. Yeah. It, it- situation when you know you see an opportunity that is fantastic and there's a crisis within the company that has nothing to do with the opportunity itself it has to do with other details that are going on you know behind the scenes how the company has managed you know something about you know how the the industry participants are looking at your platform and there's a lot of work to do to really fix the platform you know some of it dealt with people some of it dealt with product some of it dealt with investor relations, and when the Vermouths came to the table with Ron Suber, it really was a catalytic event. So we were crossing our fingers and hoping that things would be better and getting the right management team in place to really catalyze everything and crystallize it into a strategy that the market liked. You know, it, it's what we were, uh, again, crossing our fingers and hoping for, and it ends up that they delivered much greater than we ever expected they could and faster than we ever expected they could. Mm-hmm. Sure. Sure. So I know you've, you've made um, several other investments in this space, many that uh, you know, Lenin County risk listeners would recognize, and I, I feel like you've sort of become sort of the most active, really, equity investor that we, that we have pretty much. So... There's these companies like uh, like SoFi. Let's just go through some of these just really quickly and tell us, you know, what you see or, or what you saw when you decided to invest and why uh, why it was a good idea. So let's just talk about SoFi real quick. Sure. So I actually have an affinity for student lending because after uh, after Capital One and before QED, I built a student lending company. So 
when student lending uh, opportunities started coming across our desk, it felt very familiar. And uh, Nino and Mike Cagney are two of the best financial engineers I've ever met in my life. Mm -hmm. And tackling a category like students, it felt fantastic. Um, and really, you know, SoFi it is about finding an upwardly mobile consumer that just happens to have graduated recently with a lot of student debt. And if you underwrite the customer, if you underwrite the schools they come from, if you underwrite their free cash flow, you know, the concept is you can find a near zero or zero loss customer, you know, and, and uh, you know, offer them a, a product that's at far below the rates that the government was offering them for their student loans. Because there really is an arbitrage play here where with the government, every single school is looked at with the same price. Every student is looked at for the same price. Mm -hmm. So it was really finding the best of the best, the upwardly mobile consumers, and ultimately, you know, they're the equivalent of trying to, to become right now the first republic well before first republic could bank the customers. Mm -hmm. Right. And, you know, and obviously that's, you know, they're, they're talking about an IPO now. They're growing like gangbusters and certainly that's going to work out to be a very, very good investment for you guys. And another company that's growing really fast is Avant and you were fairly early on, on board there. You know, their bandwagon. What, uh, what, what did you like about Avant when you first looked at them? Yeah. So if, if anyone in the audience has ever met with Al Goldstein, they'll realize that he is a force of nature. <laughs> yes. His, his third or fourth business that he's building, he's very pragmatic, very aggressive, but measured in the steps that he takes. I remember, you know, having a conversation with him very early on and saying, you know, we're either going to be best friends or you're going to kick me out the door because what I like about your business is it's a boring consumer finance business where you make money on interest, right? I mean, it, it's not about anything other than offering the consumer a product that fits their credit profile and there aren't games being played. You make money on interest. Mm -hmm. You know, Al shook my hand and said, you know, we're best friends. That's what I want to do. You know, you understand the business. You know, let's figure out how to build this. And, you know, ultimately, we've been modestly helpful to, to Avant and the business, but Al and his team are just superstars. They've built lending businesses in the past. You know, they knew what they were doing. Uh, guidance from us was really just offering advice and helping them in the early days get a, a few things together. But, you know, this team could crack any market. Right, right. Yep, I agree. And I'm going to, Al is going to be a, a guest of my podcast, I hope, uh, here coming up soon. And finally, let's, let's just talk about Orchard. You know, I had uh, Matt Burton on here a few months ago, and they're obviously at the, at the whole center of the marketplace lending ecosystem, and you guys are, are, are on board there as an investor. What, what do you like about Orchard? Yeah. So now that the general idea of, marketplace lending or, you know, peer-to-peer -peer lending or even specialty origination of lending assets with non-banks, whatever you want to call it, now that it's arrived and people understand it and believe it's here to stay, it's time for an infrastructure layer to really pop up to support this new set of players. And, you know, Matt Burton and there are a handful of others are actually crossing the divide from ad tech over into fintech because they realize that some of the same tools that were very helpful in the ad tech world are going to be helpful as the number of players expand in fintech. And Matt Burton is one of those individuals. And, you know, what he was building felt very familiar to us because we, in, in our, our earliest years of, of QED, we actually invested in quite a few ad tech properties, one of which was MediaMath, which was, you know, the first DSP in the ad tech space. And really what Matt Burton is building is a DSP for lending, where there are obvious people who are trying to find loans. And those loans need to be described. The, you need to understand the characteristics of them. You need to understand how they perform. You need to create a bidding strategy for them. And you need a tool for executing your bids. And on the other side, you know, there's the actual inventory itself. And there are players that want exposure to the people who are buying. And, you know, really matching up the two so that it's not, you know, one-to-one -one relationship where every time you want to light up a new platform, you have to directly integrate. You know, you can integrate with Orchard and Orchard does work of, of doing diligence on the platforms and then ultimately integrating with them. 
and then creating the exposure layer, again, of all of the data, the reporting, the bidding, uh, all of it, for very low rent. It, it just becomes incredibly compelling for all parties in the ecosystem. Right. Okay, so I just want to um, pull back a little bit and look at the industry as a whole. I mean, you were, you were at Lended, obviously, a month ago, and you know, saw there's there's a huge amount of interest. There's so many deals. I think there's been more deals done in the last six months than there has in the entire history of this industry, it feels like, anyway. So what do you think about the money that, that's flowing today? Do you feel like it's uh, it's there's too much VC money trying to find the next uh, Lending Club or Prosper? I mean, do you think it's too easy to get funded? Yeah, I mean, I, I mentioned this at Lendit, but we probably talk to on the order of 200 new lending businesses a year now. And if you go back a few years, that number might have been 50. So, you know, a four or five X increase in number of businesses. A lot of them start to feel very much like me too businesses. And, you know, what I would say is there are certain industries and certain types of businesses that a very smart generalist investment professional or very smart generalist entrepreneur uh, can crack. And lending isn't one of them. So, you know, competencies need to be built through practice, experience, cycles, asset classes, uh, customer profiles, credit segments, uh, marketing channels. I mean, it's, it's a very, very complex business. And, you know, I know some incredibly smart VCs that are investing in the space. And the unfortunate part is they don't know what they don't know because this is a complex industry. And what we're seeing is a lot of these platforms, the, the new entrepreneurs also don't know what they don't know. So when you have funding sources that don't know the right questions to ask, and you have very compelling entrepreneurs trying to tackle big problems that also don't know what they don't know, you know, it creates uh, some gaps that are going to appear over you know, the coming years as they grow. So for instance, very few of the platforms or investors really understand the true nature of regulatory risk. You know, a lot of these platforms are trying to use new data sources, for instance. And if you don't understand Reg B, then you don't have perspective on whether it's a good idea or a bad idea, or the platform is going to get in trouble or not be allowed to use the data. You know, there are too many platforms also launching with not enough differentiation. And, you know, understanding how to launch a new financial service product in a, you know, a saturated or a competitive marketplace, I should say. You know, that's a whole nother set of questions. And in one of my earlier blog, you know, posts, I actually talked about one of the questions that I ask all businesses, which is that if faced with perfect information, would a rational consumer choose your product? And very few of these new platforms can answer yes definitively. So again, I, I, I think, you know, to cut to the chase, too many platforms are trying to emerge too much money is being thrown at it, but there's still room for some, you know, a next generation of giant to emerge because by no means have the emerging winners, you know, covered the entire space. Right. So then what would it take on that note? If, you know, so you say you look at 200 lending businesses a year. I mean, what, how, do, how does one really, you know, position themselves such that you would be willing to open your checkbook and, uh, and make an investment? Yeah. It, it might sound a little crazy, but what you're looking for is an unfair advantage, All right? So in, in a new platform, you want something that's so differentiated, you almost want to be able to say no one else has that. You know, another Me Too platform that's a little better on one dimension, maybe they'll succeed, maybe they won't. You know, but ultimately that's a tough game. And, and I don't like playing tough games. I, I prefer, you know, these, these businesses are difficult enough to build on their own that you want to make sure that you have a reason for existence in the ecosystem. So I'm looking for things like privileged access to customers, right? Some marketing channel advantage. You know, too many people are fishing in the open waters of the internet competing with the other, you know, players that are out there. And to me, that's not a winning strategy in a segment that's already been cracked by some other players. I'm looking for a world-class team and that consists of, you know, not just the founder, but, you know, some of the things I talked about from an experience standpoint. And if they don't have the world-class team yet with all of the experience, they recognize it and are willing to let us actually help hire into their organizations. 
Another very important point is that we're looking for a moral compass that points towards true north. You know, there are too many ways of making money in financial services, especially when you start to get into high price lending, that if you don't have a moral compass that points towards true north, I mean, even one or two degrees off of true north uh, will ultimately get you in trouble over time. And we have no interest in that. So, I mean, that that's really it. And you know, there are a lot of asset classes out there that have yet to be cracked. You know, there are a lot of uh, business models and, and propositions out there that will resonate with consumers and small businesses. So it's, it's really about assembling everything in the right way. Okay, so I want to switch gears uh, right now and talk a little bit about the white paper that you penned uh, just a short time ago, the hourglass effect. So I guess a couple of questions. First, give listeners a a little bit of a summary about the white paper, how it came about, and what were you actually trying to achieve by by producing this paper? Sure, sure. I mean, occasionally there's just a topic that's begging to be written about, and I think this is one. The way I think about it is, I, I don't know if you've ever been to a party where a group of people are discussing a topic. And it's really obvious that no one in the group actually understands the topic that they're talking about. So you you as an outsider are listening in on this conversation and you realize it's an interesting question, but no one has perspective or, you know, the insight to actually answer the question. Mm -hmm. And that's what this really, that's what this really felt like where the hourglass effect, uh, the hourglass effect was meant to tackle the topic of why haven't the banks come back? I mean, it's a very, very simple question where you look at Prosper and Lending Club and some of the other platforms, you know, SoFi and Avant, and you you see this growth in next-gen lending, you know, whether it's a marketplace model or a balance sheet model, and you say, what's happening at the banks? Because they have a lot of advantages that if they decided to uh, come back into this space, wouldn't that mean doom for a Lending Club, Prosper, Avant, SoFi, or any of the other players? And I found myself answering that question a lot, whether it was to a VC looking at a new platform or it was to an entrepreneur that I was meeting with and talking to, it came up frequently. And then when your partner in crime, uh, Jason, uh, actually asked me the question about a month before the Lended conference uh, and said, look, this is something that I'm being asked a lot. Do you have any answers I should be giving people? It was really the catalytic conversation to just say, look, let let me just write a paper on this and, you know, get some information out there with my perspective on the topic. And that's really the origin of the paper. Right, right. And I've got to admit, it's one of my questions as well. And and Jason and I would uh, would chat about it, uh, you know, on a somewhat regular basis because it's it's sort of been the big dark cloud, not so so much a dark cloud, but a big unknown that's been uh, hanging over this industry now for many years. So I want to actually go through some of the, the, the parts of your paper here because you really take us on a, on, on a very interesting historical journey and um, in, in the paper. And I just want to briefly touch on the, some of the different eras that you, that you talk about where you, know, you talk about firstly the boom era where you know, the banks were lending freely. I mean, you said you did like you know, 4 to $5 billion in personal loans uh, at Capital One. So I'm, I'm really curious about firstly you know, Capital One Built their built their business, but you know they're, they're on they're a credit card business primarily. That's what they. Um, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but that's sort of it seems to me where they position themselves. And so then, how do you go along and justify building a personal loans business you know, at Capital One? So Capital One had a, a very dominant position in the credit card market, but it also did have other product lines. So expanded into auto, expanded into personal loans. You know, had aspirations on being in you know home loans and HELOCs you know, a variety of different asset classes as it went down the path of actually buying banks. So, you know, personal loans was just one of many business units within the company, even though, you know, the largest business and the most established business was credit card. So, you know, the personal loans business, when I took it over, had been around for a few years. And for a while it had grown, and then it started to kind of level off, and then it was forecasted to actually either stay flat or I, I don't remember if it was going to shrink a little bit, but profit was going to be disappearing from the business. And when I took it over, it was really trying to figure out why and what could be done to actually fix that growth trajectory. 
and it was a very competitive environment. I mean, uh, the first thing you have to ask is, you know, does this product have a place in the market for any particular customer segment? And that was a really difficult question to answer because at the time, you know, people were really tapping into their homes for equity, right? So their home was, as I called it, an ATM machine in the paper. And whenever you had a large project to do, if you were a homeowner and you had equity in your house, the most logical thing to do was to tap that home equity, you know, for a home improvement project or for debt consolidation or for a vacation because it was a, an advantaged product, you know, very low interest rates, very significant access and availability of credit if you had equity in your home, very easy process at the time to get a loan and tax deductibility of interest. So really hard to compete against that product on one side and credit card on the other, where there were you know, many offers out there of 0% for 18 months, 0% for 12 months, you know, all sorts of rewards associated with spend and balance transfer checks just flying around the industry. So you know, it was just very, very difficult trying to find the segments that the personal loan actually appealed to. And it was really zigging where the industry zagged and found segments where it did appeal. So what what were those segments? And so you felt like you obviously weren't cannibalizing other business lines. Is that is that correct? Well, there there was a little bit of that. It's hard not to when you know you're offering something that maybe some of your own customers would want. You know the the fixed rate nature of an installment loan that amortizes over a fixed period of time can be very appealing for consumers trying to work their way out of debt. And what we did is we found a couple segments. One was, you know, a longer term product, you know, a five year, six year, seven year personal loan product that kept payments very, very low and fixed, you know, appealed to people who are trying to pay their way out of debt. You know, there was another segment, which would be the renter population, you know, that didn't have access to home equity loans, which therefore made the personal loan product more competitive. Those are just some examples, but there there were some segments out there that, that this product did appeal to. Right, right. Okay. So then, you know, you obviously are able to, like, you know, this this business was going great in the mid-2000s, but then, as we all know, you know, the bust came. And it's curious that, pretty, that every single bank exited this business. I mean, I know you talked about Discover being an exception, but pretty much every bank exited this business. Why do you think they couldn't ride it out? Yeah, uh, it's it's a very interesting question. And when when we talk about the the businesses actually shutting down their units, they shut it down to the point where you couldn't even find a personal loan on a website. There are no collateral materials in the branch offices. I mean, it it was as if it didn't exist. So it was an extinction event for the personal loan business in the the banking industry. And you know, part of it really came down to the forward-looking forecast and all of the big battles that the banks were fighting at the time. So, you know, those of us who have lived in banks understand that, you know, you have a forward-looking forecast that affects, you know, how you think about your business today. And when you have to look ahead a year or two years or three years in terms of the losses that you expect on a product, and from an accounting perspective, actually book an entire year worth of losses the day that you book the product. It's really difficult to justify keeping the business around, even at subsistence you know, levels of originations, because you don't know if you should be originating anything at all when faced with a business that's projected to lose hundreds of millions of dollars in some banks' cases and billions of dollars in other banks' cases. So it was easier to just shut the doors, let the loan book amortize, figure out how to collect against it as best as possible, and then figure out how to deal with the bigger issues the banks were fighting because the personal loan business was still a drop in the bucket. You know, if you look at the Bank of America of the world, you know, you know, Citibank was facing its problems. Capital One, you know, was navigating you know, some of the, the losses as well. All of the banks had bigger issues. And when you're faced with big issues, you've got to focus on them. So shutting the doors on the personal loan business was the easiest thing to do, especially when faced with a business that was projected to lose massive amounts of money. But then you, you, know, you also say that you know, these projections were made like in the depths of you know, 2008, 2009, where you know, 
everyone thought the whole world was falling apart and no one knew whether the, you know, what, what would happen. You, you point out that losses were nowhere near as bad as, as the most pessimistic projections and if these if banks had stayed in, it would have actually, it, it wouldn't have been that bad. I mean, what, um, can you just talk a little bit about the, you know, what actually happened now? We're, we're, we're many, many years past that date and we have the, the benefit of 2020 hindsight, but uh, at the time, um, you know, banks shut it down, but in reality, they didn't need to, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, one of the jobs that I was responsible for at Capital One was corporate loss forecasting, and I would never wish that on my worst enemy. I mean, it's a really, really tough job mm -hmm. because you know you're wrong. Uh, it's a matter of by how much, and you know, are you even close to the projections, or or, or are your projections even close to what reality is going to unfold? And you know, you're dealing with backward-looking data. You're dealing with you know some forward-looking projection methodologies. And again, you just know you're going to be wrong. So part of the problem is when you're forecasting forward-looking losses, when you're at the peak of a recession, you don't know you're at the peak. So if all you're seeing is a climbing curve, if all you're seeing are economic figures that are getting worse, not better, you know, the job loss rate was at uh, a very, very high level. If you look at you know, some of the backward-looking metrics like the personal saving rate of the consumer in the United States, it was at really bad levels. And you, know, you could march economic variable by economic variable, and you said, until these things start getting better, I'd better project a bad economic environment into the future. And then what happens is if the world starts correcting, you know, you're not willing to, you know, project out that it's going to continue to, to cure. It's just not the prudent thing to do. Right. So you're always going to be wrong. But what I would say is the best business you can book is probably at the peak of a recession because you're projecting things are going to be much worse and pricing it accordingly right. than it's actually going to end up being. So that could end up being some of the best book of business that you, that you end up writing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sure. So then, obviously, you know, we go, we we've been in a recovery now for many years, and uh, and you know, we we all know the story. You know, the Lending Club of Prosper are just uh, doing phenomenally well. There's new other players like you know Avant, SoFi doing phenomenally well, and you know, banks ha have been largely absent from this uh, from this rise. And you know, I want to actually talk about the the, the future because we we all we all know the the boom right now is. Um, is happening in this industry and in, in part of this recovery that we're still experiencing. But you, you talk about reasons why a big bank hasn't got in. And I wanted you to talk a little bit about why and you know, some, of your, some of your prognostications on the, on the future and you know, talking about where, you know, you know, where banks uh, may, may come in. So let's first just start about talk about why, you know, despite you know, the very public um, success of, uh, of this industry that banks haven't come in? Yeah. Well, you know, banks actually have a, a long institutional memory. In fact, I would say probably any big company in any industry does. But, you know, banks in particular, you know, if bad things have happened within a business unit or within a product, it's hard to undo that organizational memory. So I do know of quite a few people, you know, uh, some very good friends who have tried to relaunch some of these businesses within the banks, and they just keep encountering barrier after barrier after barrier. So, you know, there, there really is a long organizational memory. In addition to that organizational memory, you, you have to recognize that today's environment is different than the environment when all of the systems and product were live in marketplace. So there's a bunch of IT debt that would need to be paid. New systems would need to be dusted, or the old systems would need to be dusted off. Or new systems, you know, built or contracted with third parties to get these systems up and off the ground. So there's actually a lot of IT work, you know, associated with launching uh, a product that you've shuttered the doors on. And, you know, that requires, you know, even more institutional fortitude, you know, to make the leap and build the product again. So, you know, you've got a lot of reasons why the banks aren't, aren't coming back directly. You are seeing some of them dip their toes in the water in a very expected fashion. So some of the banks, 
um, have decided that the first thing they're going to do is to make the product available as a cross-sell to their existing customers. So they're tired of losing their own assets to another organization. So the first thing they're going to do is not aggressively cannibalize themselves, but at least make the product findable. Uh, and there are a handful of banks that have you know, put it back up on their websites and have enabled it back in branch. Mm -hmm. In fact, you know, some of these banks are allowing you to start the origination process online, but then they drive you into a bank to close the loan, which is the opposite of what a lot of these customers are really looking to do. Right. right. They start online, they want to consummate the product online, and the banks still don't get it. They want to do the verification face-to-face. -face. They want to try to cross-sell them incremental products face-to-face and they're just more comfortable with the rhythms when they can see and touch the customer. Right. So they, they really haven't relaunched again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, and you, you talk about the future where, you know, obviously one option is going to be that they're not, they're not going to do anything. Yeah, I, I want you to talk a little bit about the, the concept that you, you discussed about the knife fight, which is you say that we're, we're in right now. What, what do you mean by that exactly? Well, it's, it's actually... Pretty funny, I was in a board meeting the other day, I won't say with which company, but their marketing person came out and said that we're in a knife fight. I don't think they realized I wrote the paper that, you know, referred to knife fight, but they talked about, you know, the industry and how things were unfolding as a knife fight. And, and really it just means that you're in a competitive marketplace. And it happens in all industries eventually when there's good economics and good product to be booked. So, you know, uh, I remember in the late 90s and early 2000s at Capital One, we had a set of competitors that we were aggressively competing against on a regular basis. And it was the same. Just means that if you're all in the same channels and you're all trying to originate similar customers, that it's a battle. And it means that your acquisition costs are going to be, you know, slowly going up unless you can figure out, you know, channels or products that differentiate, and, and that's really what's happening in the industry right now. Okay, so then, you know, the, you you talk about you know that you think it's 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 unlikely that that banks are just going to restart for the for the points you just made, but I want to talk a bit about the the, the fifth um, thing that you talked prognostication about uh, lending as a service. And this is something that I, I personally think is a, is a huge opportunity that isn't talked about enough yet. And I want you just to give, you know, give the listeners a bit of, a bit, a bit of an explanation about what, what you mean or what that, what that is and how you think it's going to evolve uh, in the coming years. Sure, sure. So Prosper was our you know, first investment in this space of next generation specialty originator of lending assets. And you know, over the past seven years, we've now, we've invested in 15 origination platforms that directly originate uh, small business or consumer loans. And you know, really we, we came upon this trend because we saw a fragmentation occurring of the value chain where no longer did you need to be every single thing in the value chain in order to make a loan. You know, you didn't have to have a bank charter. You didn't have to have deposits. You didn't have to have, you know, world-class capabilities in, you know, credit underwriting. You didn't need to have, you know, servicing and collections. It, it was really about tearing apart the value chain and reassembling it any way that you wanted to. So if you wanted to become a specialty originator where you had a lot of, a lot of your focus on, originating the customer, but you didn't want a service, well, there are players out there who could service for you. You could fragment off that piece of the value chain and let someone else do it for the business model. You know, or if you felt like servicing was a big advantage, you could uh, have that as part of the, the value proposition and then charge, you know, your, your customers accordingly for that. So when I talk about lending as a service, it really is just a, an, a continuation of the fragmentation of the value chain, where now you have some smaller banks, even large banks, and you have brands that are non-banking institutions, and you're allowing them to basically say the asset that we bring to the table is access to the customer, and maybe that's all they want to do. And if they have the ability to access the customer, 
in this world of a knife fight, it gives them an advantage, right? Because they have access and channels to customers that a lot of these platforms might not have access to at a reasonable cost. Mm -hmm. So if they can access the customer and with the brand they've built, uh, the channels that they've built, they can get their attention. They no longer need to do everything downstream in the value chain to be able to make loans. And the platforms enable them overnight to basically deliver competencies around credit underwriting, you know, competencies around account management, around collections, recoveries. You know, it enables them to basically manage an investor group or capital markets group or even just a reporting function on how the assets are doing if, if the originator wants to balance sheet them. So, you know, the capabilities that have been built by these larger platforms, you know, it, it really enables a complete fragmentation to the point where all you have to do is deliver the customer uh, or even access to the customer and everything else could be done by one of these lending as a service platforms. Okay, so one final question. I'm going to put you on the spot here. So, say we're five years out. It's it's twenty. It's year 2020, and you know the, the, this industry is still growing well. What role are the banks playing? Are they primarily partnering? Do they have their own? Uh, have they acquired platforms? Uh, and I'm talking about sort of the mid to large size banks because we already, I mean, the, the, the smaller banks, are, um, there's a pretty clear trend going on there with the partnering piece. So the large to mid-sized banks, how are they playing in this industry? You know, well, I think the mid-sized banks are already starting to partner as well. You know, you have some companies like SunTrust that are very vocal in their, their earnings calls about how they're partnering with one of our other fantastic portfolio companies, Green Sky, uh, to originate assets. And, you know, there are other mid-sized banks you know, that are doing the same already. So I think the regionals are uh, going to pick and choose the asset classes that they want to originate themselves, and they're going to have in-branch originations of customers and in-footprint origination of customers. But in order to make use of all the deposits that they're able to gather, because they really are deposit gathering machines, they are fantastic at getting people to walk into their branches and hand them money. And, you know, as a result, I, I think they have to develop capabilities, or, or I should say, they have to borrow or rent capabilities from other people because they don't have the ability within their own footprint to make use of all the deposits. And then I think for, you know, some of the larger players, it might even be some of the same, you know, picking and choosing the asset classes that they want to be world class on. And they do have the ability to invest and hire, you know, world class people, you know, to manage large business units. They can build the capabilities. A lot of them already have the capabilities in house, you know, competing against Capital One in subprime auto or Capital One in, in credit card you know, is something that's a daunting task. I think you are going to see some competitors emerge there. But Capital One is always going to do that business themselves rather than outsource it to someone else. But you might find, you know, some of the bigger banks, you know, picking and choosing asset classes that they're less competitive in and, you know, finding a player to partner with them to do it. So I, I think you're going to see lots of different things emerging from the banks. You know, you might see some banks looking to acquire some platforms. I mean, SunTrust did it years ago with Lightstream. Mm -hmm. And you might see some banks find some platforms that have merged to buy their way into a marketplace that they've kind of abandoned. But you're going to see different things from different banks. Right. Okay. Well, thanks, Frank. I'll keep talking about this for hours, but we need to bring it to a close. I really appreciate your time today. Well, uh, appreciate being here. And uh, if there's anything I can do, let me know. Okay. Thanks, Frank. See ya. Bye. I just want to touch on one point there. You know, Frank talked about SunTrust and you know, their acquisition of Lightstream, and they are basically acquiring borrowers online. But what's interesting to me is that SunTrust, 
in the latest round at Prosper actually invested in Prosper's latest equity round. So they certainly don't see themselves as competing against the platforms as much more of a, a partnership. And it's also interesting to me that not that the Frank never mentions the light or fences a likelihood in the white paper that a, the, a bank is actually going to restart one of these installment loan businesses and go head to head with Lending Club and Prosper. Uh, he expects that's, that's a very low likelihood. So it doesn't mean it's going to be all smooth sailing and the, these banks have very deep pockets. But it seems to me that the partnership route is going to be one that uh, is is most likely. So anyway, on that note, I'll sign off. I very much appreciate you listening to the show and we'll catch you next time. Thanks. Bye.